This is an unsponsored video, reading a portion of The Uses of Enchantment, The Meaning and Importance of Fairy Tales by Bruno Bettelheim. Introduction, The Struggle for Meaning. If we hope to live not just from moment to moment, but in true consciousness of our existence, then our greatest need and most difficult achievement is to find meaning in our lives. It is well known how many have lost the will to live and have stopped trying because such meaning has evaded them. An understanding of meaning of one's life is not suddenly acquired at a particular age, not even when one has reached chronological maturity. On the contrary, gaining a secure understanding of what the meaning of one's life may or ought to be, this is what constitutes having attained psychological maturity. And this achievement is the end result of a long development. At each age, we seek and must be able to find some modicum of meaning congruent with our minds and understanding have already developed. Contrary to the ancient myth, wisdom does not burst forth fully developed like Athena out of Zeus's head. It is built up small step by small step from most irrational beginnings. Only in adulthood can an intelligent understanding of the meaning of one's existence in this world be gained from one's experiences in it. Unfortunately, too many parents want their children's minds to function as their own do, as if mature understanding of ourselves and the world and our ideas about the meaning of life did not have to develop as slowly as our bodies and minds. Today, as in times past, the most important and also the most difficult task in raising a child is helping him to find meaning in life. Many growth experiences are needed to achieve this. The child, as he develops, must learn step by step to understand himself better. With this, he becomes more able to understand others and eventually can relate to them in ways which are mutually satisfying and meaningful. To find a deeper meaning, one must become able to transcend the narrow confines of a self-centered existence and believe that one will make a significant contribution to life. If not right now, then at some future time. This feeling is necessary if a person is to be satisfied with himself and with what he is doing. In order to not be at the mercy of the vagaries of life, one must develop one's inner resources so that one's emotions, imagination, and intellect mutually support and enrich one another. Our positive feelings give us the strength to develop our rationality. Only hope for the future can sustain us in the adversities we unavoidably encounter. As an educator and therapist of severely disturbed children, my main task was to restore meaning to their lives. This work made it obvious to me that if children were reared so that life was meaningful to them, they would not need special help. I was confronted with the problem of deducing what experiences in a child's life are most suited to promote his ability to find meaning in his life, to endow life in the general with more meaning. Regarding this task, nothing is more important than the impact of parents and others who take care of the child. Second in importance is our cultural heritage when transmitted to the child in the right manner. When children are young, it is literature that carries such information best. Given this fact, I became deeply dissatisfied with much of the literature intended to develop the child's mind and personality because it fails to stimulate and nurture those resources he needs most in order to cope with his difficult inner problems. The pre-primers and primers from which he is taught to read in school are designed to teach the necessary skills, irrespective of meaning. The overwhelming bulk of the rest of so-called children's literature attempts to entertain or to inform, or both. But most of these books are so shallow in substance that little of significance. But, but most of these books are so shallow in substance that little of significance can be gained from them. The acquisition of skills, including the ability to read, becomes devalued when what one has learned to read adds nothing of importance to one's life. We all tend to assess the future merits of an activity on the basis of what it offers now. But this is especially true for the child who, much more than the adult, lives in the present and, although he has anxieties about his future, has only the vaguest notions of what it may require or be like. The idea that learning to read may enable one later to enrich one's life is experienced as an empty promise when the stories the child listens to or is reading at the moment are vacuous. The worst feature of these children's books is that they cheat the child of what he ought to gain from the experience of literature, access to deeper meaning, and that which is meaningful to him at his stage of development. For a story truly to hold the child's attention, it must entertain him and arouse his curiosity. But to enrich his life, it must stimulate his imagination, help him to develop his intellect and to clarify his emotions, be attuned to his anxieties and aspirations, give full recognition to his difficulties, while at the same time suggesting solutions to the problems which perturb him. 
In short, it must at one and the same time relate to all aspects of his personality, and with this, without ever belittling, but, on the contrary, giving full credence to the seriousness of the child's predicaments, while simultaneously promoting confidence in himself and in his future. In all these and many other respects of the entire children's literature, with rare exceptions, nothing can be as enriching and satisfying to a child and adult alike as the folk fairy tale. True, on an overt level, fairy tales teach little about the specific conditions of life in modern mass society. These tales were created long before it came into being. But more can be learned from them about the inner problems of human beings and of the right solutions to their predicaments in any society than from any other type of story within a child's comprehension. Since the child at every moment of his life is exposed to the society in which he lives, he will certainly learn to cope with its conditions, provided his inner resources permit him to do so. Just because his life is often bewildering to him, the child needs even more to be given the chance to understand himself in this complex world with which he must learn to cope. To be able to do so, the child must be helped to make some coherent sense out of the turmoil of his feelings. He needs ideas on how to bring his inner house into order, and on that basis be able to create order in his life. He needs, and this hardly requires emphasis at this moment in our history, a moral education which, subtly and by implication only, conveys to him the advantages of moral behavior, not through abstract ethical concepts, but through that which seems tangibly right and therefore meaningful to him. The child finds this kind of meaning through fairy tales. Like many other modern psychological insights, this was anticipated long ago by poets. The German poet Schiller wrote, Deeper meaning resides in the fairy tales told to me in my childhood than in the truth that is taught by life. Through the centuries, if not millennia, during which in their retelling, fairy tales became even more refined. They came to convey at the same time overt and covert meanings, came to speak simultaneously to all levels of the human personality, communicating in a manner which reaches the uneducated mind of the child as well as that of the sophisticated adult. Applying the psychoanalytic model of the human personality, fairy tales carry important messages to the conscious, the preconscious, and the unconscious mind on whatever level each is functioning at the time. By dealing with universal human problems, particularly those which preoccupy the child's mind, these stories speak to his budding ego and encourage its development while at the same time relieving preconscious and unconscious pressures. As the stories unfold, they give conscious credence and body to id pressures and show ways to satisfy these that are in line with ego and superego requirements. But my interest in fairy tales is not the result of such a technical analysis of their merits. It is, on the contrary, the consequence of asking myself why, in my experience, children, normal and abnormal alike, and at all levels of intelligence, find folk fairy tales more satisfying than all other children's stories. The more I tried to understand why these stories are so successful at enriching the inner life of the child, the more I realized that these tales, in a much deeper sense than any other reading material, start where the child really is in his psychological and emotional being. They speak about his severe inner pressures in a way that the child unconsciously understands, and, without belittling the most serious inner struggles which growing up entails, offers examples of both temporary and permanent solutions to pressing difficulties. When a grant from the Spencer Foundation provided the leisure to study what contributions psychoanalysis can make to the education of children, and since reading and being read to are essentially means of education, it seemed appropriate to use this opportunity to explore in greater detail and depth why folk fairy tales are so valuable in the upbringing of children. My hope is that a proper understanding of the unique merits of fairy tales will induce parents and teachers to assign them once again to that central role in the life of the child they held for centuries.